I think that uh, one of the things that the media missed entirely was the fact that uh, it was a very democratic process. We really operated on the basis of consensus. There was leadership, but we always went back to the group to really find out what the group was comfortable with, and we were uh, committed to making sure that we did not move beyond the group. What happened in Hamilton Hall was a culmination of two years of uh, effort on the part of many black students on the campus of Columbia University. Uh, the spring before, we had uh, come together and, and, and organized and brought a contingent out of Harlem to participate in the anti-war march that went down to the UN, if I remember the goal. I mean, that was the destination of the UN. So we worked together on that. And, we had been working together through SAS, and um, we, we had been already protesting the building of the gym under the, in the park, so we had been organized around that. We had participated in um, other events on and off campus that had to do with the, the contemporary political situation. So it, it, was a, it was not just a flash in the pan. Because whenever people would find out, at least in my life, that I was involved and around in Columbia, they would say, do you know Mark Rudd? <laughs> Failing to understand that but for the presence of African American students in Hamilton Hall, there never would have been a week-long demonstration which captured the imagination of the country and arguably was the most important mainstream student demonstration in the history of the United States. The second would be that despite the fact that we can be pretty negative about ourselves, a group of black folks who had been arguing about lots of issues for many years, policy, personal, actually became coherent. We trusted each other. We engaged in sort of some self-government right. you know, for everywhere from cleaning out the refuse to taking positions that everybody in a very diverse group could adhere to. And to looking out for each other in a very real way, a kind of experiment in self-determination that runs counter to the notion that somehow we can't organize ourselves or we're incapable of some right. kind of self-determination. And the third point is that although there's much been said about the demands and the other issues surrounding this, in the last analysis, what was uppermost in the minds of black students was the question of a gym in a park, which was a narrow strip of, gray, of, of green in Harlem, which reflected the intention of this powerful institution to disregard the needs of that community. It was symbolic, but it was important, and it wasn't primarily a focus on black student destiny, although those issues came out of it and black studies programs emerged. The focal point of the black students, as I recall the discussions and the intensity was, the institution of which we are a part is asserting its power at the expense of our folks who are powerless across the street. So those are the three things I would think are critical for people to understand about Hamilton Hall that they never have understood. First generation American. My parents were from Barbados and Guyana and Haiti. And my father was a race man. And you know, people don't use that term so much anymore. But meaning that, you know, I I grew up knowing who uh, W. E. B. Du Bois was. I grew up knowing who Marcus Garvey was. I grew up knowing who Frederick Douglass was because uh, he taught me about those people. And, I mean, even though he was upset, having taught me, you know, about Jim Crow, having taught me about the racist institutions here in this country, um, and the need for change, you know, he was upset when I went, went into the building. I came from uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, another classmate, uh, Carlos Spurlock, was also from Connecticut. We were in the same class. Um, I went to a high school called Weaver High School, and uh, my parents were activists in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, 
that's part of why it was very easy for me to get involved in Hamilton Hall. My family history uh, is one of consciousness about race and trying to uh, advance uh, opportunities and um, uh, the status of our people. Uh, my dad was involved uh, a lot in uh, the black community in New Haven, Connecticut where I came from, um, serving as police commissioner, housing commissioner. He was the, the first black on a lot of these commissions. Uh, he brought the Urban League uh, to New Haven and he was a, a member of the NAACP and different uh, family, friends, and relatives. Um, my uh, aunt and uncle in South Carolina had a real consciousness of uh, the responsibility of us as blacks who had some advantages to uh, do as much as we could uh, for the rest of uh, our people to be able to benefit. And that was a strong, strong influence. It wasn't necessarily something that people had said, Fred, you got to do this. But just being around uh, all those different people who had gone through some pretty harrowing experiences in many instances uh, had, had really put it into my consciousness. But did I go to Columbia thinking that I was going to become a student radical? Not at all. I was there to get an education. And it was the education that was going to allow me to, you know, uh, uh, to contribute. In 1964, the first group of black students who constituted more than just a smattering of black students appeared on the campus and created a sort of center of gravity, uh, which built over time around a lot of issues. That's why when Hamilton Hall jumped off, there were people like Bob McKay and Basil Patterson and Percy Sutton and H. Rap Brown who came and they all came in and they said, you all know this is a great bluff, right? that all this is taking place because everybody's afraid that if they arrest the students that Harlem will rise. Right. And that's why black students were so important. But we all knew was we were a paper tiger. Mm -hmm. That the people in Harlem had been through a lot. They'd been the King Rebellion just a few weeks earlier and prior others. And that probably wouldn't happen. But that great bluff was based on the fact that we did have a connection to the community. And people like uh, Juanita uh, Clark, Clark and um, a whole bunch of people Different groups came up and showed support for us because we'd had a continuing connection, really built up over about four years of organizing around the war, about Harlem-based issues, uh, about issues relating to our support of SNCC and what was going on in the South at Claflin and other places. So this was, as Leon says, the culmination of a long series of events uh, involving black students and politics on campus. The night before, there had been a meeting of a number of groups on campus talking about the problems of the gym and about whether or not the student body could be motivated to have demonstration. And everybody said, students are tired, they're worn out, they've been protesting and demonstrating for four years. Remember John Jay at the cafeteria? The cafeteria workers had been on strike for right. four years. People had either walked or been sympathetic to that strike. The war had been going on, people had rallied against the war. And there was a sense of fatigue among the students and the leadership from a number of different groups that I can mention. People from SAS was there. I think Cicero or somebody else from the Qs was there. Several of the white organizations were there. We were all talking about it and we said nothing's going to happen. And I could really feel that spring that something was in the air, something was happening. There were race issues, there was the issue of the war, um, the two incidents that I mentioned combined both of those. And then there was the, uh, uh, what was going on with the gymnasium. Um, in uh, Morningside Park, which was uh, heating up and there were protests by community uh, residents and uh, we were covering this in the spectator. So all this stuff was, uh, was brewing and then um, it was pretty exciting. Um, and, and you felt that um, something was going to blow. When it exploded, uh, I was one of a number of people uh, who assumed the leadership position. We took the fence. Some people took the fence down. I don't know. That might not have been Eustace or Leon, but some people <laughs> took the fence down. There were a few police officers who had the wisdom to let people do it. And then, after standing around the hole for a while, everybody kind of filtered back to the center of the campus where there were still several hundred people. 
And somebody said, let's have a teach-in, because teach-ins were common in those days. And so everybody goes to Hamilton Hall, which is one of the main buildings where clients are. Right. And everybody, this is a mixed group, white folks, black folks, left, right, all kinds of people just sort of milling about and talking. And over time, somewhere the idea said, arose, that we should keep the building until our demands were met. Of course, we didn't really have any demands. Initially, Mark Rudd, chairperson of SDS, ran to Ray Brown and said, look, we got to put together a steering committee, the black students and the white students. I want you to be on the steering committee. And Ray told me, ladies, that I wasn't going to be on that committee by myself. <laughs> and so he asked me to be on the committee. He got Cicero Wilson uh, on the committee. And so that was, that was the uh, African-American component of that initial committee. Towards the end of the evening was, certain tensions began to grow because black students were really different in the sense that we had, our cohesion wasn't ideological. I mean, essentially, we were black folks who happened to be thrown together on a campus that thought that its black students would just be white students with high melanin content. <laughs> I hadn't given much thought to how we would fit into this community. Right. And so we had come together with many fights and arguments and disagreements. And um, one of the uh, uh, law school students in the building at the time, a friend of mine actually, he said, well, why do you guys assume that you can speak for all the black students? And we said, well, we've had a couple previous meetings and we thought we had a mandate, but if there's a problem, let's poll people. And we went around the whole room and polled every black student there and asked them, did they accept our leadership? And they all said yes. And there was obviously some tension about having everybody stay together. And so a decision was made that they should take other buildings. And there was, I say, a consensus, although there's some folks who say they got thrown out. I don't think that's true. African-American students seem to be much clearer about what it meant to disrupt a major university, to hold a dean hostage, right? The real thing about the black-white split was that the two groups realized that we had two different political identities. The blacks wanted to stop the gym. They figured the best way to do this was to hold the building, barricade. The whites, on the other hand, saw and, and still see that our goal is to radicalize other white people. We didn't want to confront other students coming to class. We thought that our, our, we should confront our enemy, the administration. But we didn't realize we were, that we were much too timid, and that what we really had to do was to show our, our moral strength and hold the building. Now the blacks saw that we were split amongst ourselves, that we weren't disciplined, and that we really didn't understand what the correct militant tactic was. So they asked us to leave. I felt that the emphasis was being taken off of Harlem and the fact that this was a segregated facility and there was as much talk about the war as there was about Harlem and my concern was Harlem and what was happening there and the fact that we as black students were part of an institution that was putting this segregated facility. So I was a little harsh in my treatment of the white students participating with the black students in making this point. And then when, after we went into Hamilton Hall, it became clear that there was too much mischief going on. There was so, suddenly some red paint appeared on the wall. And one of the things I think that we were all clear on within the black students, that if we were going to do this, we weren't going to be armed. We weren't going to burn down the campus. This was a Martin Luther King style sit-in where you block access to the building. Second, we did not want to be charged with anything but trespassing. It wasn't going to be destruction of property. It wasn't going to be anything that would, uh, they could put a tag of criminal on us. Um, in the same sense that Martin Luther King was arrested for criminal trespass, that was the charge for the sit-ins. That's what, you know, we were making sure that it didn't go beyond that. And so when the decision was made that they should go somewhere else, um, I think there was both there's other buildings and also for the sense of control within Hamilton Hall, so we would not have a lot of craziness uh, going on. I think that black students uh, grew in number after the white students left. When we first put the chairs up against the door, there was eight of us. Eight, eight. There was a very eight. small number of people who were there putting that. the chairs. After the white students left, we said, we'll put the chairs up. It was a very small group, and we had no reason to know who was going to come. Come on, that's right, that's right. And then we were pleasantly surprised. I won't say shocked, uh, because not everybody knew what was going on, but um, people came, and as, as uh, Ray and Leon was saying, there was just a vast difference in political philosophy among the black students. But we were 
we were sure about segregation and we were sure about Columbia um, and the arrogance of Columbia. Um, and so that, I think, is what caused the initial cohesion. I was going to uh, a class in Hamilton Hall one morning and I noticed that there was a big group of people uh, outside the building. And so I said to someone, what's going on? And they said, well, black students in SDS have taken over Hamilton Hall. I said, really? They said, yeah. And so I understood at that point decided that I was either going to be in or out. And I decided to be in. And I walked into the building and it changed my life.